welcome to Nikon Sessions. In today's episode, I'm joined by Tara and Harry. We're going to be talking about how photographers can be influenced by other photographers, other work that they've seen, whether it's consciously or subconsciously, how that might affect some of the pictures that you guys take. I'm really excited to look at some of your shots, but we're also going to look at some shots specifically from the late Peter Lindbergh and how some of the things that he shot in the past might have affected some of the work that you've both done. So I'd love to know a little bit more about you guys and where you started out in photography. Yeah, sure. I'm Tara. I'm based in Northamptonshire and I'm a fashion and portrait photographer, predominantly based out of my studio in Northampton. My name's Harry Skeggs and I'm a fine art wildlife photographer and Nikon creator. I photograph wildlife all over the world. Uh, from Antarctic to Madagascar, and uh, specifically focusing on megafauna and predators. Tara, the question that I really want to ask is, when you made that transition from weddings and then going into more into portraiture and having your own studio, yeah. did you start looking at other photographers' work to think, oh, you know, I actually really want to get into the portrait side of things rather than the event side of things. Did you really kind of change your approach to photography? I think I've always had that instilled in me. Okay. You know, I've always had that interest in the fashion world. And I was a child of the 90s, so I grew up with Lindbergh and, you know, the supermodels. You know, yeah. Kate Moss was the queen. Well, she still is, right? So um, I've always had that in me. And it was just the, my favorite part of the weddings was always the portraits where I could get a bit more creative and, and work with different lights and different, you know, Get lovely portraits of the bride um, and so so yeah I, I think subconsciously maybe people like Lindbergh have influenced me but it wasn't really a conscious thing. It's really interesting that you said that you're not directly influenced by Lindbergh because when I look at your pieces and this is intended as a compliment they honestly look like they could be Lindbergh oh, pieces they're, so they're beautiful. <laughs> Um, That's such a compliment, thank you. <laughs> and it's intended to be and 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 you know it does just go to show how how um, assimilative art is you know you don't necessarily know that you're getting influences from things um, just because they're around and like you say they're on magazines that they just kind of come innately um, influential and it's sort of similar to me in that you know I, I can't say that I've studied him as a direct influence but then when I look at his things I can see there are clear lessons that have either been sort of learned percolated through art generally mm. um, or again sort of subconsciously having seen some of his things around so it's very interesting how we can just sort of consciously pick up on, on uh, tips like that. Lindbergh was a pioneer of natural beauty mm. and um, he, would, he would prefer a model with no makeup and natural hair and I think when he was working for the high-end publications obviously they had a different <laughs> idea but um, I, think, I think I've really picked up on that as well. Yeah. Like when, I, when I'm sorting models I go for uh, you know, someone Raw. that can pull it off naturally with a, real, with a soft mouth yeah. and, and soft features because as we know he was also against retouching. Yeah. Right? And so he just wanted things to be as natural and as, as beautiful as possible. And he used to say people's beauty is in, in their natural beauty rather than the retouch or the makeup. So this is one of my favourite of Lindbergh's work. Um, I think it really encapsulates what he's known for, which is the sort of rawness, but also just being able to capture that, that personality. I think you get Kate's personality really direct and centre, and it really just bores straight through the photograph. And that's what, that's what great photography is about. It's a capturing a relationship and engagement and experience. Um, you really feel like you kind of know her. Um, and that's what I think every photographer should be aspiring to, whether or not you're a portrait photographer or a wildlife photographer, you're trying to create connections. Yeah, I really love the softness and almost the vulnerability in Kate's eyes in this image. Um, she's obviously very young here, maybe 16, 17, it was early in her career, I think, but again, she's obviously got that bond and that trust with the photographer and, and you can tell there's a connection. You know, it's, uh, it's soft, but it's powerful. Yeah, it's very powerful. The life and the journey that Peter went through is something that's incredibly well documented. There are documentaries, there's books, and there's incredible information out there on that life. But what I'd really like to, to know is what was your journey in photography? Where did you start out? How did you get to where you are? How did you get to owning your own studio? How did you get into kind of fine art, that type of thing? So Tara, I'll start with you. Um, so um, I'm predominantly self-taught. Um, about 10 years ago, I was in the corporate world working in marketing for a big corporation. And I was at a crossroads and had to decide what to do. So I started doing um, portraits for people. And I had one of those big last of light backup, you know, backdrops that would pop up in people's living rooms and would do family photos and was questioning my own sanity a lot of the time. Um, and then uh, a friend of mine was getting married and she had no budget for a photographer and said, if you don't do it, nobody will do it. So um, I jumped on to help her out. And that just set the wedding ball rolling. And um, I stuck with that for maybe six or seven years. Um, I had my weddings in Hello Magazine and Brides Magazine and um, 
yeah, so I was quite successful in that world. It was really um, the COVID pivot that made me okay. decide to step back from that arena a little bit and focus on what I was more driven by, which is the fashion and the, and the portrait side of things. So. And do you think that that's where you, you really enjoy photography now? Do you think it's a, a definite step in the right direction for you? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I like that I can be more free creatively in that world. And you might have a brief from a client, but you can still, um, you know, work to your own, you know, work with your own creativity rather than the wedding day can be, you know, uh, a bit more biased. So Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. <laughs> Harry, for you? Um, so I never really planned to be a photographer. Um, I started off life very interested in painting and um, sculpture. So I did a lot of portrait painting and studied art history at um, Cambridge. And it was only really I, when I went traveling and I picked up a camera um, and was just terrible with it that I began to realize how difficult a skill it was. And I kind of became quite obsessed about it from there. Um, like Tara, I was sort of completely self-taught, so just making mistakes and making mistakes and trying to fix them. I was encouraged to enter into a competition which was um, National Geographic Photographer of the Year. Uh, and I came runner-up first time round, um, having never done anything with my photographs. And I suddenly thought, well, then, you know, there's clearly something a bit more to it than that. Um, but it was really, I think, cemented by um, when I got a letter from Sir David Attenborough, um, which had some, some sort of lovely things to say about my work, that, you know, it suddenly kind of sparked this real passion and ambition in me. And I've been sort of embarked on this, this journey ever since of, of helping propel wildlife fine art into its own right. And so I suppose one of the key things that I really want to ask about is black or white or colour. So obviously a lot of Peter's work is renowned for being that it's black and white, straightforward, like you talked about, mm. almost no retouching, There's, you know, it's very straightforward. It's the image that does all the talking. Mm. The first question is, is how do you decide if an image is black or white or colour? Because I know that Harry and Tara, you shoot both in most cases. So. My primary ambition is to shoot in monochrome. So yeah. I'm normally going out there to try and find monochrome images. Um, they appeal to me. Um, and you learn to see in monochrome almost. Things that work um, in monochrome don't necessarily work in colour. And I think the best photographs are the ones that can be said very simply. And, and you can't get simpler than it being in monochrome. Yeah. Um, and that makes it just such a clean, powerful, raw way of photographing. I think um, one thing Lindbergh did say is the black and white to him represents reality. Whereas to me, I think it represents more a memory. Mm, and nostalgic. It, yeah, yeah, exactly. And more melancholic, you know, in black and white. And I prefer that look. And I, I suppose one of the things that I really want to know about as well is, do we think that the medium that that black and white picture is, whether it's on a screen, whether it's printed, do you think that makes a difference? Because I do feel like black and white images on a print do look a little bit more striking than they do sometimes on a display. And I don't know if it's just because I think displays are always in colour, but I feel like a print as a black and white makes a huge difference. Uh, for me, uh, print is always the best. It's print is yeah. king. Um, I think there's a richness to it. It really absorbs the blacks, I think, in a, in a way the screen doesn't. It always retains that sort of slightly glossy, kind of high, high contrast kind of feel, whereas you really get the nuances and the subtleties of monochrome in, in print. Um, and it just makes it much, much more um, powerful. And I think it's also a scale thing. I mean, however big your monitor is, it's not as big as you can print. I think there's a timeless element to black and white, which you don't really get with, uh, with the colour so much. Fads come and go with colour editing, I think, and, and when it's black and white, it's, yeah, it's timeless. So what I think we'll do is we'll start taking a look at some of your pictures specifically. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to talk about your thought process and maybe, the, maybe you had some thought process before you took the shot, maybe you didn't. Yeah. Um, but we'll go through some of the processes and how you got to that final result. So, Harry, this shot here, I really like this. I love the light in the shot, but I'd just really like you to talk me through the process, your thought behind this and how you got to this end result. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this, this was actually um, a photograph taken on editorial assignment. Um, and we were writing an article about the silent extinction of giraffe. You know, a lot of people know that rhino are disappearing and elephant are disappearing, but giraffe are actually disappearing at a much quicker rate and a much wider rate than, um, than these sort of icons of, of conservation. So I had a very clear idea, as I always do, what the narrative was much before the scene. And my, my working approach is not to identify subject, but to identify light. Mm -hmm. So we were driving around, this is the Masamara in Kenya, and suddenly you got this huge beam of light just came out. And I knew that was the setting. I just needed to find a subject. And so we were sort of standing there on the jeeps, we were looking around with the binoculars. We saw in the distance, we saw this massive giraffe, this beautiful black uh, markings they have. 
and uh, we kind of inched towards him. He just turned for a second and looked at us, which is this shot here, and then walked away. But because we didn't identify the light, identify the narrative beforehand, all you needed was that fraction of a second. And I think that's an incredible way of thinking of wildlife photography, right? Because when the normal person thinks of wildlife photography, you think of this kind of chaotic, you turn up, you have no idea what the animal's going to do. Yeah. But it's, it's such a thought process ahead of time. That so you're, important. You're at almost choosing the location, the lighting, mm. and then the animal just walks in. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the animal is the last bit yeah. in wildlife photography. You know, you can control so little. The, the trick is to, to control the things that you can control. Yeah. And so we knew we had the light. Um, and, and, you know, light is what makes pho photography, not subject. Um, you know, you literally think photograph means paint with light. Um, and you can have the most mundane subject in beautiful light. It's a fantastic photograph. You can have the most thrilling subject with terrible light, and it's always going to be a flat, boring photograph. So it's, that's the thing which I think people need to be watching out for, and that's what I do. I really like this shot. We know that Harry also really likes this shot. It's beautiful. <laughs> um, so if you want to talk us through your thought process, how you got to this image, and some of the things that may have affected the shot. Yeah, sure. Um, so this was shot in Royal Leamington Spa. And um, the gowns are by a designer called Gali Lahav, um, based in Israel. And to get them over from Israel, they had to verify that the photographer was up to their standards. So they went through my Instagram and my website, oh. and I thought, oh, this isn't going to end well. But it That's did. <laughs> they signed it off, sent them all over. Um, and beautiful model came up from London. Um, and it was the last shot of the day as usually they are, right? The best ones, generally, why does that always yeah, happen? The best shot's always the last of the day. Um, I think everyone's relaxed. You're in the zone, the model's in the zone. And I just knew I got it after I'd taken it. Um, she's in there with the alliums. I've got this in a similar one in color as well, but to me, it just shines in, right. in monochrome. I think as well, it's about building that bond with the model, you know, and getting them to trust you and, and, and just trust your lead. So this is a shot that I really like. Um, I mean, big cats, lions, <laughs> um, and it, I suppose what's more striking about it is that you, you see none of the environment, like it's all subjects, so I'd, I'd love to know a little bit more about this. So this is, you can see stronger parallels here, I think, with fashion photography, and particularly with the sort of that direct engaging eye contact, you know, it really brings you in, into his world. Um, but I think where, where wildlife photography started is very documentary. Mm. The way I like to think about it is you're, you're still capturing personalities. I don't like it when people say leopard are shy. You know, it's like saying humans are shy. Some are shy, some are not. Yeah. Each have these very, very intricate um, and specific personalities. Photography is increasingly becoming about questions, not answers. Yeah. And I think having things like scars it immediately asks, like, what happened? What are the stories? What are these battle scars? And I think that allows people to stay longer on your pictures. And that's the goal, is to get people to look at it, not just flick past it. Tara, I know you've got a really good story about this shot, so if you can take me through. Yeah, sure. So I was hosting a workshop in Marrakesh. And we'd been out since sunrise in the morning. We'd been out to the uh, desert to take some, to take some portraits with a camel, and you know, uh, so it'd been an intensely long day in the heat, if you can imagine. And there was a group of, I think, twelve of us, and I'd brought a model over and makeup artist from the UK um, and stylist. So Joe, who's in this portrait, was actually the makeup artist for the day. Mm -hmm. um, we were on the rooftop of the Riyadh, and. It had been a long day, you know, we were going for sunrise, not sunset that day. And everyone was enjoying a glass of wine on the roof and the golden hour just hit and was just shining on Joe so perfectly. And uh, I just said, please, Joe, <laughs> please just go downstairs and put one of those dresses on. I'd love to shoot you up here. And up against the wall in the Riyadh on the roof, uh, golden hour, perfect. The wind just hit at the right second. And yeah, it was magical. And she absolutely smashed it out of the park and the model was in the background kind yeah. of thinking. Being shown up. Why not me? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I, I actually think this works even better that it's not a sort of pose model. You know, it feels very candid, it feels very raw. It's a really powerful photograph. Yeah, no, I think the end result is fantastic. Yeah, so. yeah, it was such a lovely day. It was just the perfect ending to a great day. So one of the things I really want to talk about is how you approach the composition of a shot. And I think one of the shots that can be quite difficult is if you're dealing with groups, whether that's groups of people or whether you're dealing with groups of animals. So I think if we look at this example shot first and just talk about your thought process around the composition here. So what I really like about this, this picture is you get this really strong composition which, which echoes their personalities. And you can see from this, this kind of pyramidal um, composition, it's a really powerful and strong, stable composition because you imagine it's, it's um, heavier at the base, crescendo to the top. And when you use composition to reflect your narrative, that's when you get really powerful photography. 
Yeah, I think these were some of the top supermodels yeah. of the 90s and all as strong as each other. And the fact that no one is um, a focal point, yeah. you know, um, mm. no one particularly draws you more than the others. And, yeah, that's, and that's very cleverly done. If we take a look at some of your examples of groups and we will talk through some of the processes that you go through. So if, if you want to talk me through the process of how you shoot with a group of elephants. Absolutely. Um, I'm sure they don't take direction too well. They don't, they don't, it's very frustrating. So this is not dissimilar in using quite a pyramidal um, composition. You're moving from the background to the foreground, um, but that creates, in essence, a pyramid as well. Yeah. And that's important as well because what I'm trying to talk about is the strength and the, the dominance of this amazing uh, matriarch. So having that stability, having that power and that dominance was really important. So it's the kind of the perfect compositional device. Not to say it's the only compositional device, but it's just the right one for this photograph. I was going to say, you mentioned there about the dominance as well. And I think you have quite a low horizon, which mm. really causes each individual elephant to break through the horizon, which really adds that dominance as well. Right? Yeah, and, and, and as you get the shot by getting down really low, yeah. and that means that you're shooting upwards, and that means that you, you emphasize the size, so you're really exaggerating just how amazingly huge this, this beautiful elephant is. When it comes to people and groups, um, I suppose we're embracing more of a, a candid and, and you know, really trying to get their relationship between the, the people that are in your shot rather than the relationship of the person speaking to the camera, if that makes sense. So if you want to talk me through how you, how you took this. So this was um, during another workshop in Alberabello, which is in Puglia, in South Italy. And uh, the way we'd styled Ellie that day was a really strong red lip. In the background, we've got a vintage Fiat 500, which was mm -hmm. cream with a red roof. Oh, nice. And we were down these back streets. These nonnas were hanging around their houses and my Italian isn't great, but they didn't speak any English. And, but they said, we used to look like her when we were young. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, come on, girls, come out, come out. We'll have a photo. And just, I mean, I'd love to, to claim this, that I'd star this completely. They're, they've all got a, like a flash of red. The lady on the left even got red toes. <laughs> and everything in the colour palette was just perfection and just by chance. And so obviously I wanted Ellie to still be the focal point. But in the background, you can see the, uh, the triangle, the pyramid shape of those beautiful, iconic, truly stone houses that you only get in Alberabello. Um, and we've got Ellie then and the nonnas almost mirroring that shape of the, of the triangle in the foreground. So obviously, we've, we've looked at loads of different shots there. We've talked about different images. And subconsciously, it's quite clear that photographers are learning from different photographers all the time, looking at how they shoot different, th different things. But I suppose... At the same time, you're still your own photographer. And I think one of the things that people often talk about is, do they have their own style or not? So do you think you have your own style or do you try and drive for your own style? Yeah, I, I think so. And I think, it's, I think it's really important that you definitely learn from others, but you critically assess what works for you versus what just works. Um, you know, often we talk about the sort of rules of photography, but there are other people's rules. You know, you should, you should do the things that you think express your art. So if there are things from you know, Lindbergh's work that work for you, whether or not it's for um, portraits or, or wildlife, you can take them on board, but it's not a case of, a case of just replication. It's a case of applying it uh, your own way. Um, you know, so you, could take, you can take the lessons of you know, that having that fantastic direct eye contact and applying it to a gorilla. Yeah. Those, that's it's inspiration, but not necessarily repetition. Yeah. Um, and that's, I think, how you begin to evolve as a photographer. You just take the best of the best and try and put it into your own work, and then you start creating your own kind of body, I think. Yeah, um, I mean, again, it's, it's usually subconscious, which is good, because otherwise it would be plagiarism. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, um, it's, an, it's, a, it's a melange of different you know, photographers and, and artists and, and everything else that, that are going on in here, and, and then it just comes out. I didn't think I had my own style until I went back through my work and I thought, I do like the vulnerability and the softness and the, and the connection and all those things tie nicely together. But yeah, I think if you emerge yourself in, in, in as much of other people's work as you can, yeah. um, it will soak in even if you don't realise it. I think often you don't, as the artist, I don't think you know um, what ties your work together because it's so subconscious. Yeah. But actually, sometimes it's easier for people to come in from the outside and say, this, this kind of thread hangs everything together. Um, and someone once said um, that everything of my work feels very calm. And it's interesting because I, I'd never really thought about it like that, but, but my, my working um, principle is, is wild and free, so everything on animals' terms. Mm. Um, and so it then makes sense that it's all calm. Um, and as soon as you said that, it's sort of a bit of a light, light bulb moment when you're like, that's right, and that's exactly what I'm trying to, to go for. Um, 
but it's interesting how we're often the last people to know. Yeah, I think it's a form of self-expression as well. And, and without realising it, your character and your personality comes up, comes through in those pictures yeah, exactly. too. It's a reflection almost. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So I think we've had some really good discussion there and we've covered some great topics. I can only thank you guys so much. No, thank you. Thank the, you. The images that we've gone through have been fantastic. So thank you for being such good photographers. <laughs> uh, but I think the discussions we've gone through have been great as well. So thank you very much for joining. Thank you guys for watching and hopefully you enjoyed this episode of Nikon Sessions.